been talking about the end times, and it seems appropriate that we talk about eternity, because one day that will be our reality. So eternity, uh, starting um, Revelation chapter 20, starting at verse 11, let's read what God's word has to say. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. And continuing on, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down. For these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have his herit- this heritage. And I will be his God and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, As for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. And that's where we'll stop. I'm going to do a little bit of review to set a little bit of context for what we're going to talk about today. So the first parts here are not going to be on your outlines. But upon death, our bodies go into the ground, but our souls return to God. When death happens, as it will for each of us at some point, then our bodies will go into the ground, but our souls will go to be with the Lord. It says in Ecclesiastes 12, verse 7, The dust returns to the earth as it was, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. And as it said in in verse 13 of chapter 20 that we just read here, it says, And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. And, excuse me, and then death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. When Jesus returns, all souls will reunite with their bodies, their imperishable bodies, and they will be judged. So when Jesus comes back, we will get our bodies back. And they will be the same bodies, but they will be made imperishable. Imperishable bodies. And it doesn't matter how you died or where you were buried or how you were buried. Your body will be raised imperishable. Even if you were lost at sea, your, the sea, it says, will give up its dead. And you will be judged, all of us will, by, by the Lord himself on that last day. There will, be, there will be books with all of our actions and what we have done. And it doesn't matter if nobody saw what you did, because God sees everything. It will be written in those books. 
And there will be a lot of people on that day who will think that they will be good enough to get into heaven, that their good works will outweigh their bad, and so therefore they'll be able to get into heaven. They think their own goodness will save them, and they will find, excuse me, that they were not good even by their own standards. Everybody who's thinking that they've done enough good works to merit heaven will be judged by their works and found to fail even by their own standards and consequences. So if you accept God's offer of grace with a believing heart, like we talked about a moment ago, you will be saved by grace. If you come before God thinking that you are good enough and that your good works are going to get you in, you will be judged by your works and you will be found to be lacking. Those are the options. Everybody is a hypocrite to some extent. I was actually just reading something this, this week about how, how our minds, just how our minds sometimes will play tricks on us even. In our minds, we don't remember the bad things we do very well. And they, they've done a bunch of different studies about this. You know, write an experience of something that you did wrong. People can't write very well there. They don't remember very many details or anything like that. Ask about some time, some time when you did something right. We can remember a lot of details about that stuff. Our minds are almost designed or, or tricked even into thinking that we're good people. We remember the good stuff we do. We don't remember the bad stuff. So it's easy to think, I'm a good person. When I stand before Jesus, he's going to say, wow, you did such a good job. But our memory doesn't always serve us very well. There's a number of studies that show that we are all hypocrites, even by our own standards. And... Another thing on this last day, many will deliberately choose hell because they refuse to accept God on his terms. There's an interview that I've I've, uh, played in for my Sunday school class once or twice. It's an interview of a British actor named Stephen Fry. And the questioner says... Who's, he's, Stephen Fry is an atheist, and so the questioner says, well, suppose it's all true and you walk up to the pearly gates and you are confronted by God. What will Stephen Fry say to him, her, or it? You know, if there is a God, then. And Stephen Fry said, I think I would say, bone cancer and children, what's that about? How dare you? How dare you create a world in which there is such misery that is not our fault? It's not right. It's utterly, utterly evil. And then the questioner says, and you think you're going to get in? And Stephen Fry says, no, but I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want to get in on his terms. They're wrong. Because the God who created this universe, if it was created by God, is quite clearly a maniac. There are going to be people on the last day who are going to say, God, if this is the way you are, then I want nothing to do with you. I'd rather be in hell. This is is what human arrogance is. We will even reject our own creator because of the stubbornness of our own hearts. C.S. Lewis has a quote that I think is interesting here. It says, there are only two kinds of people in the end, those who say to God, thy will be done And those to whom God says, thy will be done. And all that are in hell, choose it. That's that's just something that sticks in my mind. So if you come before God on that last day and you say, God, look at all the good stuff I've done. It's not going to go very well for you. But everyone who comes before the throne, empty handed of any merits, Except the blood of Jesus, they will be found not guilty by God's grace. If you come before that throne of God to be judged and you say, Lord, I've got nothing. I've I've done nothing good. I only have the blood of Jesus. Then you will receive salvation by grace. That's just some context for some eternity here. 
Okay, there's two fundamental truths of the Bible that you can find everywhere. From Genesis to Revelation, you can find this being said all, all the time. This is on your outlines. Two fundamental twin truths of the Bible. God is perfectly loving and perfectly just. God is a God of justice and he's a God of love. And those go together. They're like two sides of one coin. So they, this is important. There's no true justice without love, and there's no true love without justice. God's love is supposed to lead us to joy and thanksgiving and hope and delight in doing good. God's justice leads us to revere Him, to respect Him, to fear Him, and to avoid sin like the plague. Eternity will realize the ultimate realities of God's character. When all is said and done... It is these two things, these two parts of God's character that are going to come to full fruition. The Bible doesn't spend a ton of time talking about the eternal state. It does spend a ton of time telling us about who God is. God's justice and his love. That's a huge chunk of the Bible. God is just in these ways, he's loving in these ways. God is a person, he is a personal God, and his character is more front and center than even our eternal options, which there's only two, by the way. So the new heaven and earth that we read about in Revelation, the new heaven and earth will be the fullness of his love, and hell will be the fullness of his justice. Those two go together. These are the ultimate realities of who God is. And those attributes of God will come to full fruition in eternity. If you want to know what heaven is going to be like, study the love of God now and in the past. That's what heaven will be like. God does not delight in punishing the wicked, and He offers salvation to anyone who calls on Him. But for the world to be restored... All wickedness must be accounted for, and looking the other way is neither just nor loving. So let's talk about, let's talk about hell first. We'll end on a, on a good note. Let's talk about hell first. Let's get the, the bad stuff out of the way. Hell is as real as God is just. Hell is a reality. There's, there's some people who want to say, well... I can't imagine a loving God sending anyone to hell. That just sounds mean and not, not right, not fair. And it said, my God would never send anyone to hell. I've heard that before. Well, let's not make God into the image that we want him to be. Let's look at who he said that he is. And God says that he is just. And there is hell to pay for the sin that goes on in this world. God is both loving and just. And sin is open offense toward divine majesty. This is not just simple mistakes. And sin is disastrous beyond our understanding and it must be cleaned up to rid the world of all the suffering, the shame, and the death that go on here. In fact, the one who talks most about eternal punishment is Jesus. Jesus is the one who talks about hell more than anybody else, actually. He's constantly warning about it. You don't want to go here. Listen to me. Jesus' main word for hell, where that's translated into hell in our English Bibles, is actually called Gehenna. And there's a, some history behind that. Back in the bad kings of Israel, the days of the bad kings, they would make child sacrifices in this certain valley two false gods. And then when a good king came, King Josiah, he desecrated that valley on purpose so that people wouldn't use it for that anymore. And then after that, after that site was defiled, religiously defiled, then that became like a garbage dump where garbage was just burned. And it would be burning constantly there in this, this valley. Jeremiah actually referred to that place as a, as a place of judgment. He said there's going to be heaps of dead bodies there. And Jesus, when he talks about hell, 
he, men- he says, he uses the word Gehenna, this place where garbage is continually burning. It doesn't stop burning. It just keeps going and going and going. That was Jesus' word for hell. He says, if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes and be thrown into hell where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Doesn't stop. Okay. What I'm about to say might be a little bit of my opinion, but I believe this is what Scripture teaches. So if you want to push back at me on this, I'm I'm open to that. The Bible doesn't put it exactly in these words. But from my read of Scripture and my understanding of God, this is what I think hell is going to be. Hell is where the wicked will suffer all the afflictions that their sin brought upon others and especially God. That is what hell will be. God is perfectly just. And all of the the disgrace that was brought upon God, all of the suffering that was brought upon others, sinners are going to go through that very thing that they brought upon others. So in Isaiah 3, it says on the screen there, Tell the righteous that it will be well with them, for they shall eat the fruit of their deeds. Woe to the wicked, it shall be ill with them. For what his hands have dealt out shall be done to him. There's God's justice there. Proverbs 131. They shall eat the fruit of their way and have the fill of their own devices. Psalm 28 verse 4. Give to them according to their work and according to the evil of their deeds. Give to them according to the work of their hands. Render them their due reward. And Isaiah 43, 24, God says, You have burdened me with your sins and wearied me with your offenses. So God is burdened. He, we, when you sin, it's not just a simple mistake. You are offending divine majesty. <clears throat> Second Peter 2, verse 13, They will be paid back with harm for the harm they have done. So murderers will experience what their victims experienced. Adulterers will feel the betrayal that they caused. Thieves will know what their victims went through. False teachers who lead others astray will have their listeners' hells added to theirs. Worst of all, will not be what we did to one another, but the offense that we caused against God. That's going to be the worst. Hell is forever, maybe because it takes an eternity for finite people to experience the pain of their sin against an infinite God. That gives me pause. To think of the, 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 the offense of my sin upon an infinite God, for me to atone for that would take an eternity because I'm finite and God is infinite. Psalm 81.15, those who hate the Lord would cringe toward him and their fate would last forever. And passage we read a couple weeks ago, then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Matthew 25.46, and these will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. And a couple chapters back in Revelation, and the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest. Day or night, these worshipers of the beast and its image, basically idolaters, and whoever receives the mark of its name. In other words, you don't want to be there. Hell is not a good place. The Bible mentions it in a variety of ways. Hell is a lake of fire that burns with sulfur, a fiery furnace, an outer darkness, a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth, constant torment, and no rest. It's a bit of a mouthful, but there's 
a lot of descriptions that the Bible has for this place of eternal punishment that we sometimes call hell. And there's a lot of verses here that I could mention to, to talk about this. If you, if you want to ask me about any of those, see me afterwards. But hell is, is variously depicted here. And it doesn't really fit very well that there's a fiery furnace that's complete darkness. Usually furnaces, you know, burn brightly and stuff. And so that's why I wanted to say these are just images. These are not exact, exact descriptions. These are images of how bad it's going to be. And no one image can completely articulate how difficult or awful it will be. The worst part of hell, the worst part will not just be these parts, actually. The worst part of hell will be the spiritual loss of God. Right now, right now, even, even the, the worst people of the world know some goodness of God. You know, they, they, they get to eat they get to enjoy things in life and stuff like that. I mean, right now, I mean, they get to enjoy some good stuff. But then, God's back will be completely against them, and that will be the worst. It says in 2 Thessalonians 1.9, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His might. Another thing to point out, is that when Jesus died on the cross, it says he, he descended into hell. Particularly when he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We, the, the Bible doesn't say he cried out when he was punched or when he was scourged or beaten. It doesn't say he cried out when the nails were driven into his hands or when he was raised up on the cross and it fell into place. He didn't cry out then, but he cried out when God forsook him on the cross. That was the worst. And I think that's what the worst of hell will be too. To be completely and utterly forsaken by God. Alright, that's hell. Let's go on to something a little more pleasant to think about. But we do need, still need to talk about hell because the Bible talks about it. And so we still need to have that in mind. This is what Jesus paid for, for me. So it's still important that we, we cover that. But let's talk about the new heaven and the new earth now. The new heaven and earth will be as real as God's love is real. This is a real place. It's real. This is going to be real. In 21 verse 2 that we read just a moment ago, the new earth is depicted as a glorious city descending from heaven. And, and it's, it's difficult to picture, but if you can imagine this, this wonderful glorious city that comes down out of heaven and, and rests, and this is going to be our, our dwelling place. That, that's the picture that we have there. And if you continue on from what we just read, it goes on to describe this city in a lot of detail, actually. All of the, the precious stones and, and metals that make up this city and how radiant it is. In fact, where we get the expression, the pearly gates and the streets of gold come from that passage. This, this city has pearly gates and streets of gold. That's, that's the description that it gives of this city. And if you continue on even farther to Revelation 22, it describes this city also like it describes the Garden of Eden a little bit. Like the Garden of Eden without the curse. It talks about a tree of life. It talks about a river of, a water, of the water of life. That comes from the throne of God. It talks about leaves that will be healing for the nations. And it says no longer will anything be accursed. 
So you have two descriptions here. You have, you have like the Garden of Eden meets a glorious city. And again, these are images. We can't fully comprehend how wonderful it will be, how radiant it will be, and how delightful it will be. These are just pictures. I'm, I, I, I'm very confident that when we get there, we're going to look out back and think, boy, I had no idea how it was going to be this good. In 21.4, death and suffering will be gone and every tear will be wiped away. Think about all of the tears that you have cried in your life. And just imagine God himself putting his thumb on your face and wiping those tears all away. Like we sang about just a moment ago, just one glimpse of him in glory will the toils of life repay. When you, when you see God or the Lord Jesus face to face and you are completely surrounded by his glory, it's going to be beyond anything that you can comprehend now. Paul says, our present sufferings right now are not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed. And it's kind of fun to speculate about what might happen up there. But we will be reunited with loved ones and we will get to meet heroes of the faith. We will get to see the loved ones that we had to say goodbye to. And we will get to meet all of these people we've read about here. We'll get to hear from Noah himself about how he built the ark and survived the flood. We'll get to like sit around him and say, okay, tell us about that. What was that like? How'd you build that that ark? We'll get to hear how from David himself telling about how he defeated Goliath. He'll get to tell that story. We'll get to hear all the details. And we'll get to hear from many people who don't make newspapers, who don't, aren't broadcast or anything like that. People who do some very faithfully heroic things and nobody notices. And we're going to get to hear about their faith in spite of all the odds and all of the difficulties that they faced. But most of all, we are going to get to put our fingers into the hands of Jesus. We're going to get to actually hold the hand of Jesus and we'll be able to put our fingers in those holes. And, and right then we'll, we'll realize this is what he had to go through so that I could be here. The best part of heaven and the new heaven and the new earth will be perfect fellowship with the God that we were made to love. From the very beginning, we were designed to know God and to love him and to serve him. That's what we're made for. When we finally get that in all perfection, it's going to be like when you're putting a puzzle together and you find a piece that fits just perfectly. It's going to like all come together. The body needs food and drink. And we have food and drink here. Revelation 22 talks about the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life, with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. So there's, there's bodily needs being met there, but the soul has needs too. The soul needs love, it needs belonging, and it needs purpose. Revelation 22, continuing, They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. We have purpose, we have belonging, and we have love. 
all of our needs will be met then. All of them. And in new bodies on a new earth, I, I tend to think that humanity will thrive in all the good ways it was created originally to glorify God. Humanity is going to thrive in, in new ways. In, in, in all the ways it means to glorify God. We're going to have resurrected bodies on a renewed earth without sin or death. That's going to be pretty cool. You can only imagine about how, how great that's going to be. But I, I also believe that everyone's unique giftedness will fit together like pieces of a puzzle, making a complete picture of God's glory. Each one of us are going to fit together into this amazing picture about this is how wonderful God is. And so I imagine builders will build ever better structures in that new earth. Thinkers will ever discover greater truths. Artists will paint new dimensions of beauty. Athletes will compete and celebrate new achievements. Leaders will inspire greater efficiency. Farmers will bring the best food from the earth. Gardeners will raise flowers of ever-increasing beauty. We're going to get to do some amazing things. We don't know all much about that, and a lot of that is speculative, but I think we have good grounds for it. It's going to be wonderful. You can say that for sure. But I want to wrap up by calling your attention to something that I don't think about enough, but something that the Bible communicates to us. That believers can begin to live into this eternal joy even now. We can start that now. It's not we have to be miserable Until then, we can start living the joy of heaven now. In Hebrews 12, 22-24, it says, You have come. In Greek, there's something called the perfect tense, which means something that's happened before in the past, but still is applicable now. So kind of like when we say, it has been written. It was written a long time ago, but it still applies to us today. This is what it says. You have come, perfect tense, to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering. This is like the description of of heaven here. And to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. And to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. It's like, you're, you're already come there. You're already there. You're not there in its fullness yet, but you're there. Romans 14, verse 17 puts it this way. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Those things are available to us now. And something that I don't fully understand or I haven't been able to fully live into yet myself, but the Bible says so, is that even in suffering, knowing Christ enables us to rejoice. There's a lot in the Bible about rejoicing even in suffering. If you can rejoice even when you're suffering terribly, that's heaven. It's almost like it doesn't even matter what goes on on earth because you can still rejoice. I'm not there yet, but that's a reality. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10, He said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me, even our weaknesses, we're going to boast about that. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I don't think Paul was delusional. I think that he was 
living into the reality of Christ now, even though all of the bad things that he had to go through. He was getting a foretaste of heaven now. Acts 5, 40-41, When they had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. That means 40 lashes minus one. That's not just getting hit a couple times with a stick. And let them go. Then they left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. They left the council rejoicing after 30 or 40 lashes minus one. How do you do that? That's heaven. Philippians 4, one more, just 4, 12 and 13. In any need and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. There is heaven, or at least a taste of heaven, that's available to us now. It's there. So to taste heaven now, get closer to Jesus. Get closer to Jesus. Because heaven is ultimately the full expression of who he is. We're going to live into the fullness of it then, but we can start to know Jesus now. And the more that you know Jesus now, the more you will be able to take a piece of heaven with you right now, no matter what you face or how difficult it is. And I'm not going to say that I'm there yet, but I know it's real. I know it's real. Let's, oh, there we go. Let's um, take a look at... uh, this, this question there, and let's answer this together. How does the article in the Apostles' Creed concerning life everlasting comfort you? Even as I already now experience in my heart the beginning of eternal joy, so after this life I will have perfect blessedness, such as no eye has seen, no ear has heard, No human heart has ever imagined a blessedness in which to praise God eternally. So it says, even as I already now experience my heart, the beginning of eternal joy. That's my wish and my hope and my prayer for all of you today, that we can experience this even beginning now. Let's seek the Lord so that we can achieve that. Let's bow our heads. And let's pray. Lord God in heaven, what a glorious future that you have for us in Jesus Christ. We pray, O oh Lord, that, that we would not just wait, but that we would seek you now. That we would understand the, the glorious blessedness of knowing Jesus Christ even now. And to wait and long for the fullness of that when that new heaven and earth comes, as you said it would. We believe that, Lord. And we pray with thanks in the name of Jesus. Amen.